contribution to growth, the PhD CCI has organized prominent annual events such as the Pitex, Agri and Hortitech, Arogya Melas, Defense Expos and the Farm to Fork among many others. Hence, the government recognized its contribution by issuing a posted stamp in 2005 in its centenary year. PhD CCI is a constant partner in the progress of the nation. It shares the government's dream of making India a $5 trillion economy by 2024 and has strongly supported the Make in India, Skill India, Digital India, Startup India and Stand Up India movements. It has also been bridging the gap between policies and practices particularly in supporting the MSMEs of the country and its role is guided by the intense research it undertakes on different contemporary issues. At the very beginning of the lockdowns caused by COVID-19, the PSD Chamber took proactive measures to begin holding webinars and virtual conferences in which all the stakeholders were invited. It provided the correct platform for the trade and industry to interact with the government authorities to try and minimize the disruptions caused by the lockdowns. In the face of such a difficult situation, the government of India's resolve of building an art neighbor Bharat, a self-reliant India with inclusive growth across all sectors of the economy deserves highest appreciation. The rupees 20 lakh crore stimulus package to alleviate the difficulties caused by COVID-19 has therefore proven to be very timely. All indicators for the month of September 2020 show that the economy is gaining its vitality back again. Electricity and fuel consumption is up. The volume of EV bills increased to a record 57 million for the month. Railways increased their freight tonnage by 13% and a record 1.8 billion digital transactions were made. What the Chamber is achieving today is the fructification of a humble effort that started in 1905. That is, even before the national capital moved to Delhi, eight prominent businessmen created the Punjab Chamber of Commerce. From this humble beginning to becoming a gigantic force in the Indian business scene, PhD CCI constantly evolved, successfully addressing the needs of the times every time its initiatives got the support of prominent personalities who steered the indian economy this partnership is still going on phd cci has more than 2200 direct and 1.5 lakh indirect members across india and it has about 250 associate members and 16 state chapters the chamber has its headquarters in Delhi. It has state offices in Delhi, Chandigarh, Haryana, Jammu and Kashmir, Punjab, Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Bihar, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Assam, Gujarat, Kerala. The disruption caused by the pandemic is being seen as an opportunity to radically reform our health sector by developing world-class infrastructure and harnessing digital technology and artificial intelligence powered tools. During the critical phase, our esteemed PhD members provided timely support to state governments by building hospitals, health centers, and manufacturing world-class critical care equipment such as ventilators and PPEs. In view of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Ministry of Ayush is making optimal utilization of electronic and digital platforms for promoting indigenous practices of medicine and healthcare and digitalization of our health records. PhD Chamber organized a number of seminars, webinars on the Ayush system to facilitate knowledge building and the transfer of cutting-edge technology and skills 
so that we may truly become atam nirbhar industry 4.0 is changing the landscape of manufacturing industry in india while technologies such as robotics ai ml cloud computing and big data analytics already exist in the manufacturing sector their integration with one another will transform the way we do business the phd cci takes immense pride and thanks its members for making it a robust caucus brimming with ideas sharing with camaraderie and daring to grow the partner chambers of the phd cci are the gujarat chamber of commerce and industry the maharashtra chamber of commerce industry and agriculture Federation of Andhra Pradesh and Telangana Commerce and Industry, Federation of Karnataka Chambers of Commerce and Industry, and Federation of Industry and Commerce of Northeastern Regions. The headquarter has all the facilities that help in outreach to the business and administrative functionaries. It has a state-of-the-art auditorium, conference halls, and meeting rooms. The chamber organizes regular events and meets to facilitate the business community. PhD CCI plays a leading role in scouting for opportunities for Indian businesses abroad. As a part of this initiative, PhD CCI participated in exhibitions in Thailand, Russia, Bangladesh, Singapore, and Iran. It opened its first overseas office in Bahrain in 2017 to reach out to the GCC countries. It has also participated in several India-specific events worldwide, such as the India Expo in Saudi Arabia, the 16th Global India Festival in Malaysia, Best of India in Azerbaijan, and the Best of India show at Sochi, Russia. The chamber also accompanied the prime minister at several places across the globe. PhD CCI has signed an MOU with the European Business Group to strengthen ties in post-Brexit Europe. It has also formed an ambassadors economic forum to boost business in countries not explored much till now. When this pandemic started and when the lockdown was announced, PhD was one of the first chamber to bounce back and it filled the gap which was there between the government and the industry. In fact, uh, PSD made sure that all the problems with the industry which uh, they were facing because of various reasons, be it state center coordination, we addressed most of those issues. We represented them to the government and brought uh, most of the problems of the industry addressed at that point of time. I'm also happy to say that in last few years, PSD has positioned itself as a thought leader, as a think tank. Even in these pandemic times, we have made in last uh, six months, we have made almost 152 representations to the government. And these are backed by the research being done by our research bureau. And also we have taken inputs from the industry. And I am happy to say that the number of our recommendations and inputs which were given to the government, they were accepted. What makes PhD CCI the most innovative is its services to the MSMEs. It has about 50 specialized committees from a wide range of subjects ranging from agribusiness to airports. It has effective facilitation systems for MSMEs on issues such as loan facilitation, IPR, tenders and much more. For these, the chamber has a full-fledged facilitation center. Indian startups and innovators will play a vital role in the success of the Atmanirbhar mission. PhD believes that startups are the backbone of Indian economy, especially for generating employment and enhancing GDP to double-digit growth in the near future. Young startups in India are set to adopt radical solutions and breakthrough technology to leapfrog into the future. PhD Chamber through the Young Business Leaders Forum, popularly known as YBLF, and the Startup Forum plays an active role for the youth and their mentoring as future business leaders. These forums work effectively for promoting and developing business networking, leadership skills, organizing programs for disruptive learning, <clears throat> and simultaneously contribute to nation building. As an encouragement to performing businesses, the PhD CCI has instituted awards and recognitions for enterprises. The role of the Chamber isn't limited to business. Through its foundations on family welfare and rural development, the Chamber executes its social responsibility. And 
as the COVID-19 pandemic affected the country, PhD CCI took innovative measures to carry on functioning post-lockdown. It was one of the first chambers to go online with prominent webinars. During Unlock One, it adopted foolproof safety measures in its office, with Arogya Setu app being made a must for entry into the PhD CCI office. And member organizations ensured safety measures in their factories. PhD CCI also ran awareness campaigns on COVID safety and lent its support to ground level efforts. Member? Very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, a very warm welcome to each uh, one of you. I'm Dr. Yogesh Shirvastav, uh, one of the team members of uh, Professor Bijan Mishra, who is uh, looking after as the chair of this uh, uh, Consumer Affairs and Public Health uh, Committee. And I am very uh, thankful that today we have a very galaxy of speakers, including one of my dearest, Dr. H.P. Kumar, the former CMD, NSIC, and he's the advisor, MSME, PhD chamber. Ladies and gentlemen, as you, thank you, sir. As you all are aware that uh, uh, we are having uh, this program under the leadership of Professor Bijan Kumar Mishra, and this interactive session is on new e-commerce rules, uh, which we are going to deliberate and then discuss that what are these uh, uh, opportunities and, of course, the challenges too as far as uh, these uh, new rules are concerned. And uh, we will be having uh, a session, which is approximately two hours. And uh, this session is going to be chaired by uh, Professor Bijan Kumar Mishra. And I believe my uh, colleague Sunita has already forwarded the brief profile of all the speakers. Let me share it with you. We will have Mr. Uh, Divyanshu Tambe is the executive director, ENY. And uh, then we will have Mr. Uh, Harsh Vardhan Chauhan is the VP Marketing and uh, uh, Spencer's Retail and Nature's uh, Basket. Ms. Meghna uh, Sankara, Senior Partner, Sankala and Associates, Civil Corporate and Consumer Lawyer. Uh, she is also uh, going to join. She's already there. She Yes, she will be speaking on uh, this subject. Mr. Amit Kale, Associate Vice President, Sourcing and Supply Chain Reliance Retail. Mr. Praveen uh, Khandelwal, Secretary General, Confederation of All India Traders. He would also be there and he would be speaking. And of course, as I have said, Dr. H.P. Kumar, former CMD, NSIC and advisor, MSME, PhD chamber, he'll be speaking. And last but not the least, one of our youngest uh, uh, chair of uh, the retail committee, uh, Mr. Saurabh Bansal, uh, he would be uh, proposing the formal vote of thanks as far as uh, this entire program is concerned. So I'm very happy to see the both the committees, retail committee, as well as the consumer affairs and Public Health Committee have joined hands together. And then uh, we are having this program. And of course, uh, at the outset, I must thank Professor Mishra and the team led by Ajay Bansal and Smita, who has put a lot of hard work to have this program. Over to you, Professor Mishra. Uh, now kindly take it forward, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Yogesh. As usual, uh, you have been very kind in uh, you know, introduction of all of us. I feel very privileged. Uh, and I, I can understand you have a lot of other priorities and uh, we will be missing you, but your presence has always been a source of uh, not only encouragement, but a support. You have always been a good support to us. And I feel very happy that uh, all my friends, you know, the, all the speakers who have agreed to come and today is very important for us because I think for the first time within the Chamber of Commerce in an open manner, we are going to talk about the new e-commerce rules which have now come into public domain for comments and we will be threadbare discussing in a very constructive manner, you know, where we would decide on how do we all come together I can see my friend Praveen Khandelwal has also come. Praveen ji, namaskar. So I can I can uh, visualize that uh, it is going to be a very thought provoking conversation. We are not here to criticize in any manner. Let me tell you, we are here to find solutions. We are here to encourage business to grow in India for Indians in the interest of India. 
so we will always welcome such changes in the policies in the regulations in the laws which will actually enable the consumers to be able to get empowered able to dif differentiate between the good products which actually create value and products which are actually unsafe not of quality substandard and which is either profiteering or adopting unethical business practices to promote so we would be discussing that why there was a need to bring this change or amendment in the proposed rules which have come into public domain for comments in the e-commerce sector it is specifically for e-commerce sector we are going to discuss but of course we are going to discuss in totality in terms of trade and industry so having said that you know i would not like to come in between the prominent speakers who have come the only thought which i want to leave with the speakers today in terms of setting the agenda for which i have been given the responsibility you know the format would be that each of the eminent speakers will get 1 minute or 2 minutes to give some opening remarks you know in terms of what do you perceive what do you think is all this all about why you as a representative of a, of a particular cluster, cluster or a stakeholder what is your immediate reaction to these amendments which have been proposed that is number one i can see dr uh, mathur is there in in terms of uh, uh, kumar uh, hp kumar ji is there who is representing you know M msme and we all know that we can't do without him he he has to <laughs> guide us at every step you know when it comes to msme we have thank uh, you kishan ji thank uh, you very much nahi nahi are aap ka bina hum log kahan ja sakte hain nahi nahi jaise pravin khandelwal ke bina hum log kahan trade ke sath kaam kar sakte hain pravin khandelwal ji to pravin khandelwal ji to aaj badhai ke patra hai main inko badhai dunga are badhai bahut badi khabar hai inke liye bahut badi khabar hai yaar aise ki aise hi mota ho ja raha hai usko thoda dubla karna hai you know we are trim him down or trim him down you know so and and we have got eminent you know uh, consumer experts like vegna ji and others who are here with us i'm i'm so happy we have very prominent uh, uh, people to speak so what my request is that we will first give an opening remark then maybe i will try to pose certain questions to you all out of your opening remarks and then you can expand on that you know i will give every speaker a kind of an opportunity to speak but it can be interactive even the speakers can ask other speakers some questions if you want certain clarity on certain issue you know what what my approach is that at the end of the day when we close the session and when we are trying to you know summarize through dr uh, sri saurabh bansal ji saurabh bansal ji will summarize and propose the vote of thanks so saurabh ji you will have to play a very important role in terms of summarizing in terms of what could be the best recommendations which we could take forward you know in terms of this amendment which is proposed so that it is win win for everybody we want business to grow we want consumer to have that delight we want government to become the best regulator in the world you know so how we can bring in the best practices in today's uh, context so I i will now request each of the speakers you know to give a short introductory remark and i'll start with divanshu divanshu if you agree can you start with your opening remark because you are looked at as a very competent and uh, you know knowledgeable intellectual person in this subject to give us certain insight so let's start from you your opening remarks are you there to unmute and come are you there yes i am here can you hear me uh, yes very loud and clear please go ahead please go ahead excellent no i, I said thank you so much for uh, those kind words i think that those are the highest number of adjectives i ever heard after my name uh, and i'll try to see if i can do justice to that but uh, 
you know like like uh, most policies uh, you know one has to debate out the pluses and minuses you know at the heart of any policy making and uh, you know given what e-commerce means to us you know versus pre covid times uh, it becomes even more uh, even more relevant uh, of course e-commerce has offered us a lot of convenience and and that's the reason it has grown phenomenally uh, covid obviously has supported digital growth uh, there are i think 12 or 14 key points in the new policy and uh, i hope all the speakers bring out uh, bring out those i think uh, one of the key points uh, you know as that that one really wants to understand and see how it can be implemented and monitored I, i'll just touch upon those two key aspect one is on the fallback liability uh, which is a very um, very important point in the policy uh, and second is on the manipulation on the search bit right those are the two things uh, which are uh, which are sort of uh, uh, you know bone of contention sort of debatable points and uh, you know uh, what it means for the platform and for the sellers on the platform you know and you know creating a level playing field for smes creating a, a protective environment for consumer right so first let me touch upon fallback liability uh you know there are many platforms which uh, actively support a consumer when they have a problem uh, to deal with enabling to connect them with the sellers uh you know trying to actively solve the problem and of course there are some smaller ones which which are not well equipped to do that in the face of that the consumer is a bit stuck you know he can't individually deal with so many uh, so many sellers that uh, he is buying from via the platform so uh, policy wise it makes sense to sort of pin down the platform and say that why don't you enable it right why don't you take the you you are you are more equipped you are more capitalized you you have the resources uh, you have a working relationship with the seller uh, so why don't you you know put your hand up and and try to help the consumer in terms of solving his problem if if there are losses now we have two advocates here so you know they will obviously help us understand what loss means i mean those those things get debated uh, at length in in the documents that we negotiate but uh, for, you know in spirit that's what it means that you know a, a platform like uh, amazon or or reliance are are well equipped uh, and the policy is trying to tell them to take more responsibility uh, because the the consumer is are fragmented they are individual individual guys like you and me uh, and uh, so far it has been to this the 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 liability was to the account of the seller uh, coordination was a challenge and uh, uh, and the policy says that it's now the responsibility of the platform uh, i'm sure based on the news report that i have so far followed on this as well as speaking to some of the experts that uh, uh, platforms are going to come back strongly on this uh, there are good reasons for that as well uh, they have there 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 just thousands and millions of deliveries that they do every day Uh, so to be able to track everything where things go wrong and uh, solving for it is additional burden on them uh, which i mentioned uh, but there is there is a good reason to do that so that's one point that i would want uh, everyone's views especially the advocates who are on the panel uh, and second yes, second point that i wanted to come to is the uh, the word used is manipulative uh, you know search result i think if you if you look at any of the research that covers marketplaces that is one of the preferential treatment to small sellers in fact any seller can promote himself by paying a certain sum to these platforms and those products get get listed on the platform or are shown to the consumer more now uh, it's a commercial discussion right i mean any most people of certain scale can do that uh, of course a larger company can do a better job at it because they have the financial muscle and a smaller guy won't be able to do that uh and you know consumer has limited bandwidth right you can when you're looking for a phone you would probably look at one page or two pages right so the guy who's on a 35th page is obviously at a disadvantage uh but it's a commercial discussion as well as a policy discussion so you know uh how do you deal with something like that and more importantly how do you monitor it right having law is one aspect enforcement of that law is the second challenge right that is a bigger problem uh, that we are We sort of yeah, so fears. we will speak on that. We will speak on that so, in terms of. Yes. So I'll we'll come back take a you. pause here. Yeah. We'll come back to so you. Yeah. You have a lot to tell us in terms of how we should move forward, and that is why 
you know with your management background and your insight into this on the subject we'll definitely look forward to your suggestions so now i would like to go to mr mr harshvardhan is he there uh, mr harshvardhan are you there Har mr harshvardhan chavan are you there yes i'm i'm very much there very good very good so let me give a short introduction uh, mr harshvardhan chavan is the is the vice president marketing and omni channel spencers retail and nature's basket but let me uh, tell all our uh, panel members and the participants that he comes with a very deep kind of a knowledge in terms of computer science engineering and uh, market intelligence in terms of working with big brands and he has have experience with like for example dlf shopping mall which is india's one of the biggest and the largest retail and destination marketplace so with uh, working with itc and godrej and accenture so what i would like you to give your opening remarks is you know e-commerce is completely technology driven and with this amendments which are proposed in terms of uh, the uh, rules what do you have to say in the proposed amendments uh, mr harshvardhan the mic is yours थैंक यू वेरी मच प्रोफेसर बिजू मिश्रा बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद बिफोर आई स्टार्ट आई थिंक माई ड्यू रिगार्ड्स टू द लीडरशिप कमिटी मिस्टर संजय अग्रवाल मिस्टर प्रदीप मुल्तानी मिस्टर साकेत डालमिया एंड ऑफ कोर्स वेरी एस्टीम्ड पीपल दैट आर विद अस लाइक मिस्टर बिजू प्रोफेसर बिजू मिश्रा एच एच पी कुमार एंड डॉक्टर योगेश श्रीवास्तव लाइक एनी अदर पॉलिसी द पॉलिसी दैट वी करेंटलीव एट हैंड has to be seen from as i believe from the lens of evidence based policy making that every government does uh the current proposed government changes to the e-commerce rules are essentially within the consumer protection act and it makes the framework under which the firms operate prima facie very stringent and that's my prima facie thought however if you look into it uh there are a lot of new provisions which are similar of what the center sought on social media companies earlier this year through its it intermediary rules uh, and yes the sole objective of this is to create a level playing field for a whole lot of micro small and medium enterprises at one end because that ecosystem even in the previous two amendments had been on on the back seat in terms of not getting a level playing field the second big focus is to get a level playing field for increased protection for consumers and the largest citizens of the country and thereby increasing liabilities for online retailers uh, and 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 uh, as as uh, himanshu has uh, divyansh has divyanshu has adequately put in up uh, there are three major factors that we will see along the discussion one is what are the changes and how they are impacting the experience of shoppers would the consumers get impacted by this policy we'll discuss that and two very pertinent points that divyanshu mentioned on fall back liability is a critical one what are the increased liabilities what impact it will have on small medium enterprises and the large players at the same time and second most importantly what are the changes within the ecosystem of e-commerce that would happen so one of the critical points is the mandatory registration and the impact on not just the incumbent players but even on other players in the supply chain like the last mile delivery players etc so while we will discuss it uh, we'll try and make and i'll share my opinion in a more holistic way to uh, to be able to do justice with what the government intends to do but at the same time make sure that what consumers uh, get impacted but somewhere we'll have to create a policy ecosystem which is more sustainable to protect their interest for the long term so that would be my intent to be able to contribute to this uh, over to you professor mishra very good uh, thank you very much you know the, you have actually uh, brought in a lot of expectation now you know in terms of Uh, we really want to hear you know what you want to suggest and where you want to take us that is very very important and i can feel that uh, you know we will get to know a lot from you today so uh, let's let's get a lady now let's get a lady now and uh, could be nobody else but uh, uh, madam megna salka who is a senior partner uh, you know with uh, Sal salkla and associates and manages the corporate consumer property taxation arbitration and advisory work so what a you know combination you know and she is also in the executive committee of the delhi high court bar association 
uh, it was in the year 2014, but she is uh, in the Supreme Court Bar Association, a member, Delhi High Court Bar Association, uh, Saket Court Bar Association, uh, Indian Council of Arbitration. So she has got uh, at every level of judiciary, she has been able to get involved. And especially when I heard that uh, she also practices in terms of her uh, organization, in terms of um, issues concerning the consumer protection. So that actually made me more interested to understand what she is going to say today on this amendment in terms of the rules. So, Meghna ji, uh, we Thank would you. like to hear from you Thank the you. opening Thank remarks. Thank you very much. Now, the e-commerce rules, if I look at the consumer perspective, they bring in a very important, the Consumer uh, Protection Act of 2019 itself introduced a very important and vital aspect which was missing all these years, which was the e-commerce. Now, what these new rules also bring in are various kinds of sales. For example, the flash sale, which, uh, uh, which happened, wherein a particular sale is encouraged, a product is encouraged, and the consumers are, uh, are left absolutely in a shadow as to the variety of products that are available. What these platforms do is they have stakes with particular um, companies, and then they uh, only flash those products, and the choices of customer, consumers becomes very, very narrowed down and it gets influenced because of mis-selling. So what these new rules are trying to, um, uh, you know, uh, promote is, uh, you know, uh, a com you know um, accountability of such kinds of misuse of platforms and accountability in terms of uh, mis-selling or, you know, if, if, if uh, there is, uh, you know, uh, the kind of, uh, you know, maybe the description of the product which used to not be available and there were no, no accountability to that, at least in the Consumer Protection Act. So what the rules are doing is bringing more and more accountability of the seller as well as the platform where they are sold so that they don't go scot-free by selling whatever comes to their mind and, and they can just shirk off their responsibilities. And also to avoid only certain segment of sellers to be able to promote themselves. It is bringing a wide variety and also, uh, you know, uh, to ensure that a fair treatment is given to all manufacturers and the consumers get a variety and informed variety, information in terms of the quality that they are buying, information in terms of the manufacturing source, the origin source. So all of this is the aim of the e-commerce uh, rules where they, uh, they can you know, pin down the exact uh, defaulter, if any. So good. Uh, uh, you have anything more to add as in your opening remark? I, or should, go to the I, next? I think let's move in and, be, and as in men. Okay, very, have... good. Very, very good. So you you have again touched on very important issues and uh, you you mentioned about e-commerce coming in into the definition or in the ambit of Consumer Protection Act of 2019. It gets mentioned like we, we had done with direct selling. So uh, all the formats are slowly you know being brought in. Whereas right. as a consumer, we all, we always know that a consumer is a consumer for any format, whether it's, you know, our brick and mortar retail store or whether it's e-commerce, you know, for a, for a consumer, anybody who is in the business of selling is a part of the Consumer Protection Act. But anyway, we've got now a lot of clarity in terms of where these platforms would come in and how they will be treated. That's so now let's go to Mr. Amit Kale. Amit Kale is uh, associated as a associate vice president sourcing and supply chain reliance retail. And he has again more than 22 years of experience, comes from a packaging kind of an academic background and has worked uh, with organizations and got recognition for his innovativeness you know, in packaging. And he, he has worked with a number of you know retail chains in the country. And what I would definitely like to hear now is because you see reliance is one of the key players who are emerging in the marketplace today you know in india and as, as it goes in the public domain that reliance is also uh, has been uh, talking about such kind of regulations to come in so can you give us your opening remark on this amendment which has come is it in your favor or it is not in your favor Mr. Sir, Mr. Kalev is in a uh, meeting. He will join us uh, around uh, 15 minutes. Okay, okay. No problem. We have 
uh, tell him to take his time. There's no, no hurry. Uh, we have a very prominent friend, you know, he's my friend. You know, Praveen Bhai, he's, he's like my brother. I don't know for how many years I know him, you know, but I know him because uh, we are on, this, uh, on, on the same coin, but two sides of the same coin. He's a retailer, I'm a consumer. So a consumer can't do without a retailer, a retailer cannot do without a consumer. And we have been very good friends in developing number of policies. And he's a known public figure. You all know that, you know, he, is, he always doesn't miss a point. He he's tweeting every minute, I think, and I get uh, so many uh, tweets from him every day that uh, his request to retweet I am not able to match with. You know, it's, it's so difficult. It is it is so difficult. But Praveen Bhai is uh, Secretary General of the Confederation of All India Traders, and you will be very happy to know, which I want to tell everybody here present, that this organization for the first time recognized a consumer organization and I got awarded and recognized by them. And I feel so happy that a trader organization recognized a consumer activist. There is something to that, you know. So Praveen Bhai will tell you what is it and what is uh, going to happen about this amendment where he has played a definitely a very positive role to make it happen. So Praveen Bhai, the mic is yours, your opening remarks. Uh, my dear friend, my my very very close colleague uh, Bijan Bhai, the eminent uh, panelist and the distinguished uh, audience, uh, let me first take this opportunity of being on this platform to convey my deep gratitude to Prime Minister Mr. Modi, uh, MSME Minister Mr. Nitin Gadkari, and of course the man who has been a catalyst the Commerce Minister, Mr. Piyush Goyal, for re-inclusion of traders under MSME. Today, this order has been, uh, um, ha has been issued, and certainly now the traders will be more responsible being a part of the MSME once again. So I take uh, this uh, forum to congratulate the government for this uh, I mean, uh, much-awaited uh, step. Secondly, uh, I'm coming to the point for which this uh, August uh, uh, webinar has been organized. Well, uh, we all know that since last 10 years, the e-commerce uh, business in India, but before that, let me, let me make it very clear that the traders of India are not against e-commerce. We are not against any particular company. We are against the unethical, illogical, and huge violation of rules being conducted by several companies in the country. So, uh, we, the country has given almost 10 years for these companies, I would not name them, for these companies to to roll their business under certain guidelines, which has been issued in press note number two of uh, uh, FDI policy 2016, which was later amended to amended in 2018. We all know that uh, the predatory pricing, deep discounting, loss funding, preferential seller, uh, exclusive uh, arrangements with brands, and uh, and owing inventory was never allowed to these companies. But on the face of it, uh, perhaps we all know, I don't know who will admit or not, but we all know the kind of business practices these companies are, are being conducted uh, in the country since last more than a decade, which is not only uh, killing the entrepreneurial skills of the people, but also hurting the consumer a lot. That is why, uh, there was a need to put these uh, uh, these uh, regulations, and I will, Bajan uh, I will not say these are rules. I will rather categorize these as the as the procedure for conducting future business of e-commerce in the country. And since these rules have come under Consumer Protection Act, these rules are equally applicable to a foreign-funded company as well as the indigenous companies also. 
not only the, the companies which are traded, which are dealing in goods or services, but even to all kinds of those entities who are conducting business on or through online mode, whether it is travel or whether it is of eating or something else. But the two things are very important, Bijal Bhai. Uh, the arguments which I am hearing uh, since last uh, more than a week, because uh, I was at the helm of affairs for all these things. Um, uh, so therefore, two arguments have come. One is that it is a protectionist step. Second is the compliance burden. These two are these two arguments are totally ridiculous, and they don't have a legal stand to uh, uh, to substantiate these two arguments. Though I will not deal with these two arguments right now, but during the course of discussion. So yes. Then, uh, I will like to uh, to draw the attention of the I mean panelist on this. But one thing is clear that uh, now the government is very sincere about uh, the uh, about the compliance of law, whether by a small trader or by a large format of the company. So therefore, these these rules are very much necessary. Keeping into the highly vitiated e-commerce uh, business, which is which is badly needed for a purification, because we have seen the tremendous increase of uh, um, consumers towards uh, uh, e-commerce business. So therefore, we also want that our eight crore traders should also avail the opportunity of being on an e-commerce platform and providing all kinds of services to our valued customers. And in the pandemic, we have done it. We we have did it. So therefore, we can we can play a major part only when there is an even level playing field. If if somebody wants to uh, to use uh, muscle and money power to kill the small traders, certainly that kind of thing will never accept it. And uh, therefore, I feel that these rules are very necessary. And uh, it is the right time, right step of the government to bring these rules so that the, all those companies who are indulging into any kind of uh, unethical business practices should uh, fall in line. That's what uh, I want to uh, make the point here. Very good, very good. You know, uh, Praveen Bhai, you have said that the rules that are made in our country, the rules that are made in our country, they actually set a standard, set a benchmark. You know, and... Uh, those, these rules or these laws, they actually uh, tell you how to conduct your business, how to ensure that you practice ethical businesses, how do you ensure that you give the value for the money which the end user is paying. So at the end of the day, these are nothing but to set standards. And these standards are based on uh, global best practices, India-centric practices, Indian psyche, you know, we have to take into consideration. So there are a number of factors. So we'll have to uh, discuss threadbare. I will. We'll all come back to you to listen to some of your proposals. And as you very rightly said, you know people are already making a lot of allegations which are without evidence. So we have to talk on evidence-based, you know, arguments, not uh, just emotionally or getting charged up and giving out of the box some reaction. So now I come back and I'll go go to our very eminent uh, personality who is a friend of mine, Dr. H.P. Kumar, we sit and share a, a common platform. We are on the board of a company where we uh, both attend board meetings together. I know his uh, kind of a intellectual capacity. He has been the former chairman, managing director of National Small Industries Corporation. I would not like to read out his, you know, bio data and his background, but I can only tell you in brief that, that this gentleman is a reservoir of huge knowledge and absolutely to do with MSME, he, I, we have, I've had several conversations with him, he knows that, on many MSME matters and he has always guided me and, uh, you know, he has also endorsed some of my views. So I like it, you know, when somebody appreciates you. So here you are, uh, Dr. Kumar, the mic is yours. Now you have to give your opening remarks. You heard all the young boys, what they had to say. Now you have to say, you know. Your your turn. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Professor Bajon Bishraji, um, and uh, also thanks to Yogesh Shirvastavji 
for inviting me here to this uh, very very important discussion and giving me an opportunity in fact uh, <clears throat> these new e-commerce rules are out now and the jury is also out as to whether uh, they are helpful to what extent they are helpful but i would say that consumers interests are the supreme and prime in any discussion that we make or any rules that we make so there is no you know doubt about it or no dispute about it while i would say this having said that we have to see that the opportunities available to the vendors in the country in terms of the opportunity to participate in e-commerce you know uh, initiative it's not a new one but of course uh, it is still evolving i would say i am you have uh, lost him i think I, sorry am, oh, you got frozen sorry are you there no no she, yeah i am continuing i'll take only one minute more yeah 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 please please no no i could, we couldn't hear you i, I okay. couldn't hear you okay so um, i was reminded of you know when i started the 63 million micro small and medium enterprises and today with this new edition of traders retail and wholesale traders also coming to this is a huge number of uh, participants vendor participants in this whole process of e-commerce either participating a small number is participating and a big chunk of them i mean um, i think almost 5 to 6 crore vendors 50 60 millions are in the informal sector they are yet to in fact onboard themselves and take the we are you know framing and implement to the ecosystem i have said in the beginning itself that the consumers interests are the foremost but then there are certain rules that i find have the potential of you know creating some kind of hurdles for even vendors and small uh, traders or small uh, you know suppliers on the platforms e-commerce platforms to have difficulties so i am only saying that these rules should be framed in such a way and discussed and deliberated and finalized so that there is no adverse impact on these small borrowers small uh, traders and particularly the micro small and medium enterprises and those informal enterprises who are not much aware about these nitty gritties and technological you know advancements i would stop here and uh, come to the specifics at a later day let us later stage well, when the very good and you are you are absolutely taken. right dr kumar you are absolutely right uh, uh, you know at the end of the day you know we have big numbers and as you know you know especially the small and medium scale plays a very important role in the manufacturing you know uh, business in the country you know the while the big brands the big brothers they uh, rule the market but the support system comes from the small and medium uh, scale enterprises and that is very important and this is where we so uh, before i go for the second round i just ask my uh, very senior colleague in the chamber uh, mr saurabh bansal would you like to as the co chair of the committee would you like to give some quick remarks on what you heard as the co-chair of the retail committee bansal sir aap kuch bolna chahenge uh, as an opening remark after listening to all the panel members or should i go for the second round so saurabh bansal ji are you there yeah i am there actually my connection is really weak but that's okay so i think uh, we have eminent panelists with us they've already shared a lot and a bright picture with us and i totally agree with hp kumar ji what he has said pravin bhai whatever he has said Ashwardhan ji also, and I think in the right spirit we should evaluate and contemplate about this particular policy and take it to the right direction for towards implementation. Now we can proceed uh, towards the agenda number two. Excellent. Yogesh ji is also here, and Yogesh ji gave a very important dimension that uh, you see, PhD chamber is the only chamber in the country 
which has a committee of consumer affairs which is combined with public health and we always try to work together with other committees like the you know retail committee uh, and the msme committee you know we always like to work together because at the end of the day you know all the work which the chambers are doing it is actually in the interest of the consumer and of course if you take into interest of the consumer you do something your business is bound to grow and it will grow many fold and all success stories have revealed that whoever is consumer centric has always flourished and gained so having said that yogesh ji you want to say something before i go to the uh, other go to the panelist again for their next round are you there okay so i would go straight away now to divanshu divanshu uh, what could be the key takeaways you would say suggest in terms of this amendment which is come where you feel that uh, we need to look at those issues very closely what are those key issues according to you and can you suggest what how we should go about bringing the right language so you know i think i've heard uh, all the all the eminent speakers on the on the panel uh, uh, i think the my objective today and in it, our objective today should not be to come to conclusion uh, it's very very you know what is the right way to go is a function of the uh, you know who are you in the ecosystem of the whole e-commerce right uh, so uh, sme will have a view uh, a, a platform will have a view uh, consumer will have a view uh, government has a view uh, as one of the stakeholders so i think uh, one has to understand the spirit one has to understand uh, uh, the uh, implication and more importantly the timeline right today these are all draft rules and the implementation uh, timelines are not yet finalized so if one says that you have to comply with with a with a certain rule by x time versus y time the 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 response of the stakeholders could be very different right so let's say one of the one of the response one of the thing is that if if you are a 10% you know plus uh, affiliated entity cannot sell on the same platform if one says that you have to comply with that within 6 month versus let's say within a period of a year or more uh, the response will be very different so there are many variables at play uh, here and and uh, you know the the implication will be far reaching so i think um, uh, what one can do today is is basically to understand what are the what are the four five key areas right i mean and uh, you know I, i'll just take one minute to bring out the other important aspect right which is around information please, please. take your time now take your time right information sharing where government is saying that even for prevention or investigation they would need access to a lot of information uh, which has which you know as as someone pointed out similar to what social media guidelines are and and there is enough enough and more heat around that so uh again so these are these are extremely gray areas uh, which needs to be you know both parties need to clarify uh, and and you know come to a uh, appropriate language uh, come to uh, from the policy it needs to get translated into the modalities and the mechanics which will be very very one needs to really apply uh, both the policy maker and the trade need to apply themselves uh, to understand uh, you know what will pan out how it will pan out uh um, you know some of the timeline do look stretched like within 24 hours within 72 hours um uh, so yeah i mean uh, you know i think uh, at this stage i have also read the policy i have had few discussion but uh but i i would really not be able to comment on what is right and what is wrong at this stage uh, they, they have each each of the policy element has uh, something good at heart but the implications are far reaching and and i think uh, they are best left to uh for for a discussion at this stage uh so that's my submission professor yeah very good very points for other panelists to also uh, contemplate and uh, share their views you know first most important thing you have said is that you know we can't uh, change within um, our whims and fancy we have to give it a proper maturing time so there has to be a timeline you know in terms of implementation which is very important to understand but at the same time we also have to understand that you know every consumer wants remedies and relief as early as possible you can't deny them and the government also as a regulator has a right to get certain information 
which cannot be denied. Of course, there are several other government uh, regulators who are there, like the Competition Commission of India, who can always call for a lot of documents, and there can be a lot of you know uh, investigations uh, done on certain you know uh, practices. But of course, what we all need to understand is, and today's objective is, let me tell you very categorically, we are not looking for solutions. We are looking for building a consensus. <laughs> How do you build a consensus? And the um, Consumer Affairs Committee of the PhD Chamber of Commerce took this opportunity to understand that how do we move forward to build a consensus? So, Professor, let me and let me just come in. I mean, let me let yeah. me clarify if you allow. Yeah, please, please, please. It's, it's okay, a so very. One of, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll take one example. Discussion. Yeah. yeah. Please. So I think. So. Yeah, I mean, so, so so look, one of the one of the guidelines is that no logistic provider of platform will provide differentiated uh, service to uh, to sellers in the same category, right? Now, what does this mean in specific is very challenging. So let's say if some seller is based out of Delhi and the the buyer like me is sitting in Bombay and ordering that thing versus uh, a seller in the same category sitting in Northeast, right, which is not well connected to Bombay in terms of both distance, ease of transportation and 10 other things, right? 10 other parameters. Uh, now to put this on the platform to give same level of service, one really needs to account for the differences at the same time, right? You cannot have, you cannot have the same, uh, same uh, level of services uh, to two sellers while they are in the same category, but there are other different boundary conditions that govern uh, how they sell or, or how the material can reach the buyer. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that at heart, it is trying to create a level playing field in spirit, but to, you know, translating that in reality has a lot of other factors, right? The, the ideal world and the real world have a delta in between and, and one needs to be cognizant of that. Uh, so that was one example. I'll take one more example, right? Which is, which is around, uh, uh, domestic alternative to imported goods. Right now, what does that even mean? Right? I mean, every product, uh, every product is different in its own way. Right? I mean, the two chocolates, uh, which are, or, or anything that is most commoditized, uh, you know, whether it is, uh, you know, you know, even the cereals that we buy, right from one brand versus other, they are different. So when you say that you have to provide a domestic alternative, then you have to clearly define the specifics of what is considered similar. Right. And to be able to do that across hundreds of thousands of SKUs, even for government to come up with that sort of list and even for, uh, you know, the platforms to comply with that and even for enforcement agencies to figure out whether they are complying it or not is a huge, huge burden. Right. So while in spirit, it is great that, you know, we should, we should promote make in India. We should give the, uh, you know, platforms are finally, uh, sales channel right they are they are fundamentally sales channel and they do influence the choice of purchase of the buyer and one would want to promote make in india so in in spirit that's great but as soon as you start talking about modalities and mechanics of it and that's very important because that's the only way you know you can't have some of these policies as subjective we we the, the objective of of the policy maker and the trade should be to ensure that the policies are as well defined as possible else you will have court cases and and all of us you know the, the we'll be more busy uh, fighting cases versus actually trying to protect the interest of consumer which is the end goal right so that's another very important aspect i mean i can go on to many more such examples and i'm sure yeah. these are, the, this is what will get debated in, in ensuing months uh and, well, and that's why yeah, that's why the yeah. objective should be to make make the mechanics very clear, take n, n, n number of examples. And again, sitting today, we can't foresee the future, what will happen, right? So we have to really think through uh, what the policy and law in for everyone so that one is able to comply, one is able to prepare. And of course, enough time needs to be given for once, once those mechanics are in place and everybody agrees. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Dhevanshu, for bringing in those examples and uh, bringing in uh, a little more clarity in terms of presentation. Meghna looks to be quite impatient. So Meghna... No, no, I'm not impatient. <laughs> what I was trying to say is that these teething issues, while, you know, what he says absolutely makes sense, it's impossible to, you know, decipher and come up with 1,000 kinds of alternatives. 
but where courts then come to play is they lay precedents. So when such propositions do come before courts, while I know it's a lengthy process and a long drawn issue and everything, we can't rush to court, but courts here in step in to create precedents, which then can be drawn as examples in various other issues. And then, you know, a, a consensus, it's a long drawn process. Absolutely. No, no, absolutely. No. In fact, what, what the, the monks was mentioning was that if by bringing in clarity, you right. avoid a lot of disputes, you know, and why That's get into a dispute when you can bring the clarity in the language of the law or the rules itself? Absolutely. So we should focus. Uh, now we have an opportunity to be creative. We have an opportunity to be innovative. We okay. don't have to copy and paste. We have to make it India-centric and let the world say that India has come out with something fantastic for the industry as well as the consumer. Absolutely. So let us do that. You know, and I think this is an opportunity for us. You know, that is how I look at it. It isn't undoubtedly. I, I, and that is why this conversation we are having today, you know. And uh, of course, uh, Praveen Bhai wants to say something. He raises his hand. Harshwardhan ji, just uh, next I, would be yours. Uh, just let let uh, uh, Praveen Bhai say something quickly. He wants to say something. He looks impatient again. Uh, Praveen Bhai. <laughs> Bijan Bhai, I, I could well imagine the points raised by my friend uh, Devyan Shu. But I am sorry to understand why these uh, questions come when the when government brings out any any move uh, about the corporate uh, retailers or about the uh, these uh, 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 these big uh, e-commerce companies number one number two why why, why sermons are not given to these companies when they are openly flouting the established uh, uh, rules of the government no, no, nobody in the nobody in the in the sector ever comes to play to give these kind of sermons to these companies. Look, the look you have to uh, comply with the with the law. No. Then when government comes out with a policy or with some kind of rule, then we always talk, it, it it has become a fashion to to make some kind of noise that oh it will be it will the. the the logistics will be very difficult. The, uh, the compliance will be very difficult. We need to uh, we need to understand the real timeline. Both when 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 a small trader of the country can comply without any infrastructure, more than twenty types of uh, laws and rules. Why why these companies cannot do that when they are fully equipped with infra infrastructure? My simple point is that these kind of questions all, always come from certain section of the society uh, at, at a point of time when government pr proposes any kind of uh, rules or or certain policies. Even, even when these uh, these people um, uh, come together and uh, and make all these all, all these no. things. I, I, I mean, no, no. Uh, uh, so, so Praveen, by let me let me go no. to Harshvardhan. Bijan Bhai, please, please, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Professor Mishra. Thank you. Hey, Mishra, I wanted to complete that sentence. What is that? जब ये जब ये लोगों को नहीं मानते हैं जब ये जब ये प्रेफरेंशियल सेलर्स इनकी 90% सेल क्राउटर जैसी कंपनियां करती है और बाकी 90% वहां पर खाली खाली ताली बजाते हैं उस समय कोई इनको 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 सलाह नहीं देता तो आखिरकार ये ये देश ये कब कब ठीक होगा व्हेन वी बी एबल टू मेक कंप्लाइंस ऑफ द लॉज एंड रूल्स सो वी कम बैक वी कम बैक टू हम लोग हम लोग बहुत जल्दी ठीक करेंगे घबराइए मत बहुत जल्दी ठीक होगा Harshwardhan ji, yes. I would also thank, like thank you to answer some of these questions which Praveen Bhai has raised. I, I will professor I will professor Bijan Mishra. Uh, thank you, thank you. But let me not digress. Uh, I think yeah. Praveen Khandelwal ji ne kuch bhot mehtapoorn mudde uthaye hain. Aur yeh bhot zaruri hai ki hum kisi bhi niti ke udeshya ko samjhe ki aur uske udeshya ko samajhna bhot mehtapoorn hai. अगर आप देखेंगे तो इस नीति का उद्देश्य आर्थिक विकास को बनाए रखना है और समान अवसर पैदा करना है सारे उपभोक्ताओं के हितों को बचाना है और 61 मिलियन सूक्ष्म लघु 
और मध्यम उद्यमों के लिए एक सक्षम वातावरण बनाना है फॉर फॉर द इंटायर कंट्री एंड देर इज अ वेरी स्ट्रॉन्ग कॉन्टेक्स्ट इफ यू लुक एट इट आफ्टर लिबरलाइजेशन द इकोनॉमिक ओपनिंग अप हैज बीन वेरी डायरेक्टली कंट्रोल्ड बाय द एफडीआई फॉर अ लॉन्ग लॉन्ग टाइम इन इंडिया द डायरेक्ट इन्वेस्टमेंट इन फ्रंट एंड रिटेलिंग वाज नॉट देयर बट व्हाट ई कॉमर्स डिड एंड आई एम कमिंग फ्रॉम अ ई कॉमर्स बैकग्राउंड बीइंग इंस्ट्रूमेंटल इन बिल्डिंग इंडियाज फिफ्थ बिगेस्ट ई कॉमर्स कंपनी एंड सो सो सम पार्ट कैन बी ट्रस्टेड दैट आई हैव बीन पार्ट ऑफ दैट इकोसिस्टम इंडिया का आज भी कंजम्पशन एक्सपेंडिचर जो खपत वे है is around 4000 billion dollars that's what consumers spend and 10% of the gdp comes from retail industry 8% of employment comes from that 61 million micro small and medium enterprises are directly related on retail as industry what i'm coming back is i'm taking a leaf from what mr praveen ji said that the purpose of this policy is to create an enabling environment and a level playing field and there are two precedents already that we have and before i come into the policy and the various dimensions of it that we have at hand is two precedents one is the it intermediary policy jo is saal ke shuru mein nikali gayi thi and in 2017 and 18 government ne ek draft e-commerce policy nikali thi which clearly meant that how fdi investment venture capitalists and private equity money in india had come for e-commerce but rather than a marketplace model we we started deploying a inventory led model which basically means the big players like amazon and flipkart agar aap zyada inventory buying karenge aur ye industry mein sab log jante hain you of, get into a position of predatory pricing so the level playing field had had been flouted for a long time till 2017 and 18 government came up saying 25% of the inventory can more than that cannot be from a single seller but a lot is on the question of compliance now with that context the second big context is it's not just about amazon it's about a bigger thing retail is not just the only industry in economy the bigger industry that is in india it's its 7 1.3 billion population and the data of consumers so the it intermediary mediary act which is a big industry agar aap dekhenge pichle 14 mahine covid mein the entire advertising industry has been disrupted and our india media media, uh, media industries like z television times of india etc they have come to number 4 number 5 google india is the biggest media company because all spends have gone to digital marketing and all the data of consumer goes to such companies so it is a contentious issue now what i am coming back is a bigger issue and praveen ji when he says or the members of cat say that is there a policy in the country which solves three objectives protects consumers interest every retail company in india has been governed by the consumer protection act so can any e-commerce company be outside its ambit no so considering that it is also part of the retail ecosystem there will be a contextual policy that will come to control the e-commerce players and e-commerce is not only retail it's not flipkart and amazon the beauty of the current policy that government has come is even the olas or ubers of the world gets come into it even the make my trips and travel players come into it so it's not just retail but it's also transport it's everything that gets sold over internet so from that standpoint i must appreciate the government for coming with a such a comprehensive policy ecosystem point number 1 second thing to be looked at in this policy is that the idea is to safe safeguard the protects of consumers but at the same time the 51 million or 61 million msmes are the only reason india's economic growth is growing if 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 you look at the india's history of last 200 years india mein sabse purana kaam hai saman ko bechna jo azadi ke pehle bhi hota tha to agar ek lagu udyam saman nahi bechega aur uski opportunity le li jayegi it has a direct impact on the sustainability of the economy hence the purpose of the policy to give a level playing field for msmes cannot be contested with that uh, professor uh, i will come to the 12 dimensions which i wanted to highlight in this policy and which are pretty simple uh, so that in we do not get diverted is there a confusion is there a policy which is so stringent that players like flipkart and amazon should complain we will get a very fair idea ki ye discriminated policy nahi hai ye level playing for policy hai and for that we need to look at 12 dimensions 12 dimensions are very simple the first is on the first big dimension is on jo sabse zyada contested hai jiska government ne explanation bhi diya hai 
जो ओरिजिनल प्रपोजल था इट इंडिकेटेड अ ब्लैंकेट बैन ऑन फ्लैश सेल्स नाउ व्हाट इज फ्लैश सेल्स अगर आप फ्लिपकार्ट को देखेंगे 65% और अमेजॉन फ्लिपकार्ट की सेल्स इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स से आती है कंपनीज लाइक शाओमी एटसेट्रा चाइनीज फोन प्लेयर वो आते हैं इंडिया में एक प्राइस पॉइंट लेते हैं जिसमें एक घंटे पर 1 लाख फोन बिक जाते हैं व्हिच इज नथिंग बट फ्लैश सेल्स हैज दैट फिनोमेनन विटनेस्ड बाय एनी ऑफ द एमएसएमई प्लेयर्स इन द कंट्री इन लास्ट 100 इयर्स नो are they not veterans in retail are pravin ji se puche there are so many veterans of retail in india but nobody has witnessed a phenomenon of selling 1 lakh phones in one hour how does that happen because you have undercut the pricing and it is predatory to the to the hilt right consumers suddenly don't realize in one day that we have to buy so much product right it's because the product gets sold at pricing which is very low then the market pricing benchmark and it gets sold by making money in in b2b businesses and not b2c consumer businesses however having said that the government has come back saying that it's applicable to flash sales and not conventional sales the, thereby making more clarity and avoiding the chances of predatory pricing see we have to look at the context and it requires sensitivity in policy making look at the person who's creating the policy for him it's not just about amazon and flipkart and big players for him it's about those 61 million msmes who does not even have the working capital to run his business for 12, 12 days does he have enough money to fund the businesses and keep discounting no he does not have so the policy has to protect his interest and predatory pricing is a very relevant point the second point is on display and promotion where it has clearly been said by the government saying e-tailer should not allow misleading ads potentially on pricing quality guarantee now if players start saying that we will give you next day delivery we will give you a delivery in 25 minutes we will give you the best, lowest price guarantee now these are promises which a small seller in india cannot do how is he able to do it he is able to promise a convenience of last mile delivery because large part of the business of the last mile delivery players without naming anybody like ecom express etc since large volume of the business comes from one or two players they get a differentiated pricing model so if i am a small player and i want to start my e-commerce website i also want to send it to the entire parts of the country i may not get the same pricing as the big top 3 e-commerce players and that is because my volume is smaller so there is a discrimination happening and hence the policy very beautifully brings into its ambit not just the retailers or e-commerce players but also the other ancillary supply chain partners like the last mile delivery players etc who also are funded by a lot of private equity players so there is a conflict of interest which cannot be ruled out and it makes sense to get them the third big thing is country of origin now let me commend the government of india mr narendra modi ji and the made in india initiative that has brought back renewed focus on the msme sellers in the country and the country of origin initiative or the clause is only to further that part what does that mean e tailers have been told that they have to mention the details of country of origin of all the products that they are selling and it is very important because it is a power and right of the the consumer that they should get to know where the product is being bought from right and it is somewhere in line with the made in india initiative so there is no problem in that the second the third big part is cancellation charges and explicit consumer consent now what happens is this is an unheard of retail phenomenon if you look at physical retail for last 100 years there is a company which is saying if you book an order with me and if you cancel it i will charge you cancellation charges it is like a homemaker going to buy groceries and says bhaiya ki saman dena and the moment she says ki nahi mera man nahi hai us kahega ki madam saman dekhne ke 5 rupaye de do an unheard phenomenon phenomenon which is nothing but cancellation charges again since the large part of the convenience promise of delivery or the large part of the e-commerce traffic is owned by the top 3 players they can afford to apply cancellation charges to bring in profitability which is a opportunity not available to a small seller and hence that's a very pertinent point to have a clause on that the two other points that are very pertinent are essentially on on the fallback liability will come to that but the most important part is no e-commerce entity shall indulge in mis selling of goods and services now this is a clause which directly protects the interest of the consumer saying that if a product is sell and there is a strong precedent that we have so if you look at globally even before us the e-commerce revolution came into china and the government jointly worked to protect the interests of local manufacturers by promoting a marketplace model rather than an inventory led model so if you look at alibaba the taobao model 
was marketplace model, which basically meant it's a platform where a small seller from Kanpur, small seller from uh, Coimbatore, small seller from Shillong can commit, put the product and an equal opportunity to sell it, right? But the other part of the business, which is inventory holding, like the Flipkart, the Amazon, or even the Tmall model or the JD model of China, they were not really promoted by even the government in China. And hence, the development of e-commerce happened through marketplace, which is allowing all sellers to come in. And that is where the selling clause also brings in its larger perspective, saying that the promise that any seller does, right, has to not just protect the interest of the consumers, but it also has to create a level playing field. The third big thing which we have forgot is the big, the big cloud or the strategic relationship between a data player like a Google and Facebook and of Amazon and Flipkart, which be, which means that as a consumer, I will go on the internet and search about buying a product. Now, if large part of the Google search engine traffic is diverted to Flipkart and Amazon, it is completely antithetical to the interest of a small player, which means that there is no way consumers will fight. The reason is we do not contest this part is because we do not see in this light. It's saying there's a big player who in a commercial market, right? And he has taken all roads that come to him. Chakka jam kar de te te, small sellers, right? Because they are not getting equal roads to come to their shops. And it's a similar analogy, which means that if large part of search engine optimization, large part of the traffic, large part of the traffic from big search engines like Google and Facebook and social media traffic goes to the top three players, how can that become a level playing field? And hence, e-tailers shouldn't mislead users by manipulating search results is a clause which the government has tried to address. Now, I can only commend the policy makers for bringing in such a finer point because this was till such time completely ignored. Uh, this is a point which neither the cat nor the small seller will bring in because they, it does, usually does not come to their mind. But certainly the policy maker who has seen it from a technical perspective and generally trying to solve the problem to create a level playing field. The other thing is sponsored listing of products and services and it has to be distinctly identified. Now. A lot of times, even after the last draft came in in 2017, saying 25% inventory and more than that cannot be to one seller, because if you look at it, all of these companies have their own subsidiaries, like the cloud tail, the pre-owned, etc. And they, their subsidiaries buy the stuff and they are selling their own stuff, right? How is it different from not flouting the front-end retailing or the single brand FDI, which India had, had has been following for so long time, right? Uh, it's it's only about changing the model. So they are e even to from the consumer aspect to be able to clarify that the distinctively identified tag is 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 very important. The last point that I will come is the fallback liability, which uh, uh, has also been talked about. Now on fallback liability with e-tailers and platforms providing services, it's very simple that e-tailers selling goods and services, they have to maintain have maintained that the liability should be with the sellers selling the goods, right? Or services while they have their own internal checks. So which basically means if as a consumer, if I've ordered something and there have been so many cases, especially in COVID times, because consumers have not been able to come out of their homes. So they are buying high value products like even fridge, laptops, phones, uh, a whole lot of things, essentials, electronic items through online. Now, a lot of times cases have come in and that have been reported to the consumer protection forums, etc. that somebody orders a phone and he gets a stone packed, right? Now, who does he blame? Who has to he, he go to? Is, is, is the uh, marketplace player being resp responsible for it? But a lot of time marketplace player says that, no, it's a seller who has done it. It's not us. So what is that protection ecosystem is, it is what is being addressed. So in a very conclusive manner, uh, Professor Mishra, let me tell you, the policy has to be supported from the standpoint that in order to make the, a sustainable environment for a re, for India's retail ecosystem, which is slated to go to $1.3 trillion in next two years, we are at $680 billion, and e-commerce is growing at a 30% CAGR. The fastest growing segment of e-commerce, uh, of, of retail industry, which is e-commerce, if it does not solve three big problems of equitable development from the micro, small and medium enterprises, protecting the consumers as they get through through the physical retail trade, right? 
and an equal opportunity regime where india has to gradually become a digital first nation which basically means every single retailer in the country has to get equal opportunity to sell online and why should he be discriminated against right and if if that continues to go on a large part of our local industries local manufacturing local handicrafts will get wiped off because they either will not get a market to sell which is reasonable enough because all consumers are there on big websites or even if he gets a market he will get very discriminated practices and policies where he is discriminated against so the intent of the policy has to be supported uh, there may be certain and that's why i initiated initially with saying evidence based policy which essentially means that a lot some parts of the policy may require further clarification for which there is yeah, yeah. different that, ways that, to go that's about the whole it idea. That, yeah. you see yeah. that is the whole idea so the, the the idea is today's discussion is to bring in those dimensions where clar further clarifications are required and we would definitely like to continue these kind of conversations meghna ji uh, i would request all the panel members to kindly put on their video because uh, our photographer is complaining that they can't see you so if you can please put on your videos uh, the panel members as well as the attendees kindly put on your uh, video uh, meghna ji i want to come to you we have been hearing about consumer protection consumer protection from all the speakers now how do you think these rules you know and you are you are so abreast with all the uh, you know happenings in terms of the national commission and the state commission in terms of the consumer disputes which you might be uh, working on now how do you think these rules would be framed which would help it you know help to uh, give that uh, immediate prompt uh, remedies you know to the consumers and how do we uh, encourage that language to be put in where it will be prompt uh, meghna ji i would like to hear from you on consumer protection professor mishra if you go th i mean when you look at the act itself the new act has provided various tiers of uh, redressal the ccpa the uh, by way of increased jurisdiction to the district uh, district state and national commission and the very fact that the buyer can approach the consumer forum in his own jurisdiction and not have to go to the place where the seller has sold increases the uh, the capacity of a buyer to get any any uh, any redressal done in his own city so that itself will enhance the possibility of a consumer to be uh, you know able to get his uh, grievance redressed one secondly there is uh, there is a nodal officer and there are various tiers uh, and mediation also which has been um, uh, encouraged by the new act and these rules where in case there is an issue you can through a, a you know a play a, a play of mediation by talks try to resolve the dispute various um, um, the nodal officer has to redress uh, the uh, consumer complaint within 45 days and there is a lot of power given even to the central authority to uh, you know suo moto give the uh, refer the matter to the consumer forums for them to appreciate the uh, the uh, complaint of the consumers so i think it has uh, made uh, life a lot easier for the consumers especially even when you know the simple one simple line by way of you know making them approach the district forum of their own city that itself will help them uh, you know get their uh, complaints redressed no, and very good. you know my only short point is the rules has defined a lot of good ethical practices in terms of conducting your business correct there is no doubt about correct. it yes now my only challenge is as i come from the consumer cluster right is that supposing i brought a good which is 200 rupees worth Hmm. And I have been shortchanged, misled, hmm. uh, promises not kept, you hmm. know, uh, misleading advertisement. It could be, it could be substandard product. Correct. Now there is there is no discussion on a prompt, easy refund and exchange policy. See, my my only contention Agreed. is my only contention is for a two hundred rupee product, would I go to the uh, district okay. commission? Would I go to the state commission? but the company can go and the company has all the resources all the uh, ability capacity to do that and they can go so my contention is there is something called the consumer welfare fund you must have heard about it. 
That's and right. And this consumer welfare fund actually mm. got created out of enriched. I'm losing your voice. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I. Where the government has. Professor Mishra, yeah. I lost your so voice. What, the internet. Yeah. Yeah. I know because you know the signals are. You always should uh, ask for it again. You know. Then you will. I'll repeat. So what I will I will say is what happens is mm. that uh, this money, mm. which is the consumer welfare fund, actually belongs to the consumer, That's and correct. this money has been recovered by the government to spend on building awareness, and they are giving huge sums of money to the state governments to build infrastructure, to uh, strengthen the uh, district commission, state commission, and their functioning to improve in terms of prompt redressal, good resolutions. Now you know that in the new act. Everything is going to be technology driven. Also, you know, people can uh, online complain and online the benches, uh, the commissions will be hearing the cases. Also, you know. So, so my my contention is very simple: that if a consumer is shortchanged, then it becomes the responsibility of the state to fight for him, or we should pay out of the comp uh, the uh, consumer welfare fund for that person to go and litigate if they have to litigate. To get that refund or exchange done, if supposing companies are not doing, so then it brings a level playing field, you know, which I keep hearing from Praveen Khandelwalji, you know, that we all need level playing field, we all need level playing field. Now, who is talking about the level playing field? For the consumer? You see, sir, uh, Professor Mishra, the uh, the Act also has a provision of no charging of uh, of any statutory fee up to five lakhs. So that aspect is also taken care of, and then there are provisions of amicus curiae in every consumer forum, which even I was once upon a time, where the court provides lawyers uh, to the uh, consumers. No, no, the, but the first, the first, first issue is how do you expect a consumer who has a complaint of a two hundred rupee product? That, that's where the, the that's where the uh, nodal officers etc. Their role will come into play. That such so, tribunals are not so, not escalated to courts. So if they if they don't do their role, then what happens? That's what I'm trying to say. You see, yes, if they don't, yes, when things go wrong, then what happens? You know, who gets penalized in what manner? Because you also know the kind of penalties which are being imposed by mm -hmm. the district commission and the state commission. They are mm -hmm. minuscule. They are not deterrent. Yes. You know, so yes. so so my small point is. That I think we have to think through these draft rules in a manner that we can bring in those languages. Can I go to? You have anything specific to say? Anything else? No, I, I'm absolutely in agreement with you that there has to be some kind of loophole management as well. While everything is clear in various aspects, even the accountability factor and how how soon the redressal can be arrived at. And triviality right. should right. not uh, trivial issues should not be taken or escalated, but should be sorted and and sorted well, rather and, and than no, you know, that, and no what? cost to the consumer. No cost. That's to the correct. Consumer. That's correct. That's a very valid point. Correct. One yeah. clarification, Professor Mishra. Yes, please. Who is it? I can't see you. Who is this? Yeah, Harshvardhan. Okay. One, one one clarification I wanted to seek from you. Yeah, please, please. It's very pertinent to your point, saying that the average consumer in India cannot have the inconvenience to go to a court or any grievance redressal authority for a small amount of hundred and two hundred rupees. Generally, he endures that pain, and only if he endures that pain for multiple times, he he chooses to escalate it through social media, etc. That's that's the general consumer behavior. He would end up writing a mail or a letter or maybe something on a Twitter, right? Now my question, right. is, for which I am seeking clarification, is since the concept of fallback liability has been introduced and the intent somewhere is to make the front-end seller responsible for any thing, which means that consumers could be buying products from a big e-commerce player without naming anybody. But a lot of times they are. You. I lost your voice. Can you all hear him? Can you hear? No, we are not able to hear you, Harshvardhan. Am, am I am I audible? Am I audible? I'm just checking. Now now you are audible. Okay. Yes. Now you are audible. So most often the e-commerce players redirect the consumers to the seller, 
saying that for warranties, manufacturing defects, yeah. etc., you may approach them and and get your problem solved. Now, as an average consumer, the consumer is perplexed, saying that if you were the front end company, you are the like a physical showroom for me, right? If I come to you for buying something, and if there is a manufacturing defect, why do you redirect me to somebody, right? And even in that case, when he asks for a refund, again those policies are not clear, and hence I am going back and seeking attention of the fallback liability clause, which essentially the intent to me in my understanding is that in several cases when the problems are arising with goods purchased from their marketplaces, e-commerce platforms, as I said, they are directing consumers to respective sellers. With fallback liability, consumers will be able to reach out to the platform itself and say that it does not matter who you are buying the products from, who do you allow on your website to sell the product. Since I am approaching, point taken. this is very well, uh, very good point. And and, yeah. and may, maybe Professor Mishra, one clarification from a legal standpoint: To what extent do you think, uh, 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 Meghna ji, that this fallback liability? is making it a comprehensive liability on these players is it is it is its enforcement easy is it is it becoming uh, uh, punitive in in the sense that it has to be or do you see some loopholes i just wanted to get more clarity on that Shandam, we'll have to see that in practicality yeah, yeah. imagine it in the uh, in the word in the way it is written in letter is very difficult so once we have it happening before our eyes is only when we come to know what is uh, the that is why like professor mishra said we have to have very crystal clear the loopholes also have to be thought of and then pointed out so that they can be laid down in a manner that there is le least yes, yes. possibility of any leakage so, or any, so, any departure yes, of absolutely so the point is you know well taken harshvardhan ji we need to think on certain language which needs to be inserted in That's the correct. draft rules which will take care of what you have just tried to express or we are trying to express. Praveen Bhai, are you there? I, I would like to come to you now. Praveen Bhai. Praveen Bhai, are you there? If not, then I'll have to go to Dr. Kumar. Praveen Bhai, you're not there. Achha, we'll wait for Praveen Bhai to come. He, he must be in busy with some phone call. Uh, Dr. Kumar, now you have heard that uh, these rules are going to bring in a lot of discipline within the e-commerce platforms, uh, would, would bring in certain kind of standard in terms of best practices. And you have heard about preferential treatment you've been given and certain uh, unethical business practices being taken. So uh, we would like to know, as you know, that all this business is highly dependent on small and medium scale. And these rules, will it affect the incentive to them, these rules, or it will actually deter in terms of uh, competitiveness and uh, being able to grow, you know, and have more business opportunities? Dr. Kumar. Yeah, no, thank you, Professor Mishra. In fact, uh, <clears throat> by and large, the rules uh, are in the interest of the consumers, and we all agree. I mean, these rules are very much required. Some kind of regulation on these big giants uh, is all uh, is always welcome. But my only concern was that the over-regulation of this e-commerce ecosystem should not affect the small and, you know, small MSMEs, micro enterprises, and also the small traders who are, uh, you know, vulnerable to the uh, demands of these e-commerce companies. Uh, what happens is in practice, I mean, whatever you say, ultimately the entire liability and the compliances are shifted by these e-commerce companies over to their sellers. And the sellers and vendors are very poor and very small. A lot of uh, enterprises, micro enterprises and retail traders and those informal enterprises have yet to enter the you know e-commerce markets because uh, uh, it's only the uh, beginning that uh, some um, some number has entered but in the smaller areas villages downtowns and these people can take advantage of this e-commerce ecosystem which is developing now as we know that it's only i think the potential uh, 
uh, is much more i was told that 300 billion us dollar it should reach this e-commerce market by 2030 and as of now it is not even uh, one fourth one fifth so if there is so much of potential and there is so much of uh, you know uh, people who are looking forward to participating in this e-commerce market i am only concerned we should be so nuanced and specific that any over regulation should not hurt these micro and small vendors retailers and these um, you know people based in the uh, rural and village areas women you know there are a lot of women who are working from their homes and now starting to develop their small enterprises micro enterprises making achar murabba and all these you know handicrafts and all these they also wish to participate on these e-commerce platforms my only point is that so, so very good well, well well taken i can see praveen bhai come back you have raised some very important issues praveen bhai my only short point is always kehte hain ki consumer ka best friend hai competition and competition brings in growth competition brings in innovation competition brings in your ability to go global you know, if you the domestic market, so naturally you can go global also. And all the companies in India are coming to they get a ready market or a good market, a huge market. So naturally they come because they are getting an opportunity here. Now when they come here, 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 why is it not in our country? हमारे देश में निवेश होने के बाद फिर क्यों कानून बन रहे हैं ये नहीं समझ में आया जब वो लोग आए तो वो लोग कुछ अपेक्षा लेकर आए तो अब हम आप लोगों से ये जानना चाहेंगे कि वो जब लेकर निवेश किए उस समय आप लोगों को डिमांड करना चाहिए था जो छोटे व्यापारी हैं जो स्मॉल ब्रिक एंड मोटर स्टोर्स के व्यापारी हैं कि भाई हम लोग के लिए तो कोई कानून आज तक है नहीं लेकिन इनके लिए ये कानून होनी चाहिए क्योंकि लोग इस ढंग का काम हो सकता करें लेकिन हाँ ठीक है आपने इंतजार किए कि वो लोग सही ढंग से काम करेंगे यू नो हम लोग के देश के कानून को उल्लंघन नहीं करेंगे कंज्यूमर प्रोटेक्शन एक्ट तो ऑलरेडी था ही पहले से 86 से था तो कोई भी व्यक्ति यदि मिसलीडिंग कोई भी अनफेयर का दे काम इंक्लूडिंग द ब्रिक एंड मोटर स्टोर यदि कोई अनफेयर ट्रेड प्रैक्टिस कर रहा हमारे देश में इवन ऑल ट्रेडर्स कम इन टू दैट एम्बिट ऑफ द लॉ so the law is always there. Now, what is the great idea of bringing this amendment now? Because is it because you have enough evidences which will prove that they are practicing unethically? Or is it because there was lack of clarity in the um, um, earlier draft which was made for e-commerce and we wanted to bring in certain amendments because it got mixed out? So can we say that Certain important things got missed out earlier, which we are trying to bring it today. Or is it because certain things we never expected, but is happening? And that is why we want to bring this amendment. What is your view? We would like to know, Vistar Uh Thank you. Thank you, Bijan Bhai, for giving me one more opportunity to place out the issues. Uh, firstly, I will like to endorse the views expressed by our learned friend, Mr. H.P. Kumar, that uh, the e-commerce spectrum should be derived in a way which could lead to even the people in uh, tier three, tier four cities, rural areas also to avail the benefits of e-commerce. We are, uh, we uh, at CIT is fully vigilant of uh, all these issues and uh, we are uh, creating our own uh, e-commerce portal that is bharati market which will be uh, in all probabilities it will be launched in the month of august when when we will liberate the e-commerce from the clutches of all these big people that is point number one my point number two is you talked about investment innovation <laughs> They, they have set up their own company in India. They are, uh, they are giving funds to their own companies. They are giving funds to burn the cash for predatory pricing, deep discounting. Where the investment has, has been placed, 
I am unable to understand whether they have uh, they have invested anything in the infrastructure. No. Whether they have invested anything uh, which benefits the country. No. Then whatever money they have brought in has been has been spent on on predatory pricing, deep discounting, law funding. My third point is we don't know they are not doing e-commerce business. They are indulging into a kind of valuation game where where the where the investor or the company is putting money uh, for the sake of getting maximum profit at the time of uh, their exit. Point number four, which you have raised, yes, in two thousand nineteen, when I met with the Shri Pius Goel, I I gave voluminous evidences. That too from their own website. That too from their own email emails. The because of those evidences, the Competition Commission of India directed its DG to to convey uh, to carry out the investigation. But unfortunately, though these companies are telling that they are not compliant. Arey Baba, if you are not compliant, why you are why why you are halting the investigation? The investigation is an opportunity for you to come with come out with flying colors, victorious. That look, we are we are following all the laws. On the contrary to it, they went to Karnataka High Court and got this case. And and uh, and then they were vacated. Now again uh, they are going to uh, double bench. So we are also party there. But uh, but this is that, that is not the subject. I will not discuss that. We have, we have, we have tremendous evidences with us. Yes, the the FDI policy 2016 was a comprehensive document, but unfortunately there was no regul regulatory or monetary mechanism. What my friend Mr. Harshvardhan was telling that in case in case anybody, whether it is a trader or a or a company, if they commit any kind of uh, mistake. Then what is the channel for penalizing them? If you, if you go through investigation procedure, then we all know how how investig investigations can be halted and and can be lingered together for more than twenty thirty years. Uh, so we we all have uh, expertise into this. But at that point, our consumer is suffering. So my simple question is that as I as I began my uh, uh, my statement. We are certainly not against e-commerce. We are we are there for e-commerce, but we want every player to be law compliant. So these rules have been brought in to make them rule compliant because uh, because we waited for more than seven eight seven eight years in the hope that these people will strengthen the Indian e-commerce spectra. And and will do a good business, good business practices and empower the consumer and the retailer. But 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 they did not uh, they, they did not they did not get a complete plan. Therefore, now we we now since last 2019, we were after the government and as a result of our own collaborative efforts, the the rules have been set out. So what I feel that that this these rules. Will be will be a, a guiding principle for these companies, but yes, unless or until we have a monetary mechanism, then uh, uh, in that case the rules have no meaning at all. We right. have asked for, we have asked for a monetary mechanism, and I and I say on record, even if my trader is indulging into any kind of uh, unhealthy practices, let the trader be also be prosecuted. I will I will never protect. And lastly, William, I am coming to your very dear subject, the Court of Appeal. Yes, I commit myself. I have to commit to be with you that very soon, with your participation, we will bring a Court of Appeal for the traders of the country, so that ultimately the consumers can benefit. It. That's all. Very good, very good. Because uh, I have been getting this assurance from you for the last ten years. I hope it comes true now. And we get some kind of a voluntary mechanism. Why everything should be regulatory? Which is apne se karna chahiye. You see, I am a firm believer that before a law comes, 
we should practice it first in a voluntary mechanism and then get to the uh, uh, regulatory mechanism because regulatory mechanism last aani chahiye jab voluntary nahi kaam kar raha hai to tabhi regulatory lana chahiye uh, abhi hum uh, i want to get to if if uh, um, amit kale ji is back amit ji are you there are you back are you with us uh, no sir he has not joined yet so what what do we do now because i have come to the almost towards the end because we have to finish by 5 o'clock with, with so your I permission with, with with your permission professor mishra one one thing on on the question that you had given to uh, praveen ji right when you had proposed that why essentially is the government being reactive to the current ecosystem and why couldn't we have created the policy before uh, professor mishra somewhere you are right even on the part of the government for last 10 years we have lagged a strong think tank which can foresee the industry disruptions agar aap piche mud ke dekhenge to we did not anticipate how technology will disrupt transport and we realize suddenly uber and ola has come in we did not anticipate how retail will come in it will do it now it's not just about e-commerce professor mishra our currency market and money market is also getting disrupted with cryptocurrencies and bitcoin and right now the government is clueless how to regulate the cryptocurrency market right imagine there are 24 billion dollars being traded without the rbi having any control can the market yeah. crash can there be a supply demand problem it is left to anybody's imagination what i am coming yeah, back yeah. is and i had endeavored not just i'm i'm not trying to refer to that two years before working very closely with dpit i had endeavored to draft something called as one india digital policy which basically on account of technology changes changes on data ownership and other things the idea was to build a think tank which has a foresight ki jaise jaise industry ka disruption hoga which we cannot stop today transport has got disrupted retail has got disrupted electric vehicles will disrupt automobile industry cryptocurrency will come in and this is a bigger phenomenon we will continue to have such debates saying that this is a typical classic three step process ek problem hogi the trader community and the impacted retail will will basically come up with a problem the government will address it ek policy aayegi fir aap policy ko question karenge ki policy clear nahi hai ab isko debate karte hain but the problem lies in this three classic step what we should do is have a think tank which have the foresight like a world economic forum does and they are working on climate change and everybody does which is our committee other than niti ayog at the governmental level which is having the foresight to saying ki agle 5 saal mein industry disrupt hongi to investment regime se lekar uh, 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 regulating policy se lekar monitoring tak aur interest consumers ke kaise protect karna hai can we do something proactively even before so that's, that that's phenomenon comes in the industry you have, you have raised very vital point and that is has been our work for the last 35 years with the government various governments coming into existence Uh, we have always been from uh, uh, doing advocacy on bringing in these things, and that is what uh, also Praveen Bhai has been doing but, for the last I nutshell, don't know how many years. But in a nutshell, Mr. Mishra, in a nutshell, just to say that somewhere, as 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 an ecosystem, we have lacked that foresight in policy making, and hence lot of challenging positions come in. And what is happening is that we are keeping a lot of traders, retailers vulnerable in this bargain. is that yeah, yeah. in the time the policy comes in a lot of people perish a lot of businesses wipe off and that is very detrimental to a sustainable economic ecosystem which may be yeah, something yeah. as a food for thought for this discussion perfect thank you i can see tanya tanya singh uh, you have uh, something to say or you want to say something and uh, before i go to you can i again find out whether amit ji is uh, coming or not uh, so that i can then go to saurabh bhai to do the summary and the vote of thanks uh, before taking certain Sir. questions which have also come in the public domain so i will i will also ask certain uh, opportunity to ask questions uh, sunita you want to say something so he is in a uh, he is in meeting so he will not be able to join sir i have just received a message from him okay doesn't matter so from stam so, uh, sir fine so th that makes things little more comfortable okay uh tanya you want to say something uh, or you just put on your video 
no so no. so professor mishra thank you so much for the opportunity so i have a suggestion and i have something to just point out which this committee should probably think of uh, while reading through the eu digital services and markets act i think our e-commerce definition in general in the policy needs to sort of enlarge in itself to first understand what are digital markets and what are digital services because e-commerce just doesn't come under retail or travel or all of those uh, you know products and services categories uh there are also saas companies which will qualify for similar rules the second piece is once we have done that discriminate or distinction sorry we should then classify it by industry because in terms of consumer complaints which was the last point that we were discussing right what happens is typically that for a zomato a refund will have different um well they it will have different classification you know with the food delivered on time was it of good temperature was it good quality etc and then also to kind of protect the companies against the consumer while i understand the consumer is important what happens is that you want to ask for a refund for everything right so it is subjective you can't expect five star quality from a three star a uh, restaurant and hence those things need to be sort of input as recommendations from all of these e-commerce players that we are also dealing with in the system and once when you I, i would urge that if you know the government is asking for these recommendations they ask for these two things the definition and the quality standards and the refund policy as they always declare on their websites to sort of drill down by piece and by segregation and then give it to you as part of uh, the 6 july piece excellent excellent you know you have given in a very useful input tania and uh, i have my you know uh, head of uh, consumer redressal professional is with me srishti uh, srishti you have raised certain uh, you know questions also so you can touch on the questions uh, so one of the panel members can address that while you can also tell the panel members uh, some of the inputs which you have already given to the government you have already given certain inputs to the government in terms of its uh, uh, recommendation in uh, terms of what changes we are expecting we have already given because sixth is the last day so we have not delayed it we have already submitted we didn't want to wait till the sixth uh, and of course i am quite sure we will have a lot of deliberation on this uh, before it gets implemented so shishti the mic is yours thank you so much professor john to for giving me this chance to speak in front of such a enriched panel i would say uh we the recommendations we have given and what uh, we could see is that the definitions uh, in the e-commerce uh, protection uh, rules were not sufficient so of course uh, certain new terms have been introduced and defined uh, in a very structural manner uh, but there were also a few very key definitions that were missing uh one question that i have raised and also we have recommended uh, the same on the protection rules is that uh, even though there are uh, more hierarchies that have been introduced for grievance redressal for consumer complaints redressal uh, these hierarchies have not been specifically assigned with uh, the responsibility of consumer complaint resolution so this leaves a very uh, very big gap in terms of uh, even the title of the rules itself so the title of the rules is consumer protection e-commerce rules and if you're not protecting the consumers essentially with the rules then what is the point so which was my question and i would uh, uh, request any of the panel members uh, to actually take this question uh, which reads while talking about all hierarchies of consumer grievance redressal in the e-commerce rules there is no authority that has been specifically assigned with the responsibility of resolving consumer complaints now why do i say that is because chief compliance officer is to ensure compliance so the regulatory compliance is nodal officer is to coordinate with the legal authorities and the resident grievance officer is to supervise functions in general so in general means uh, uh, the clause rule number 3 clause 2 sub rule 2 Uh, which is which deals with the uh, information technology act and the consumer protection act of 2019 in general so if they have a supervisory role now in the previous uh, uh, rules the unamended rules there was a position of a grievance officer uh, that was specifically assigned the responsibility of acknowledging consumer complaints and to take care of the consumer complaints now with the resident grievance officer Uh, other than where the position has been specifically assigned there is no other place in the rules where the term resident has been used again so now we are taking uh, a new term grievance officer 
which is now amended and which has not been assigned with the authority. So who takes care of the consumer complaints? So who would take it? Uh, you know, uh, so thanks to the spot, uh, Meghna and uh, Praveen Bhai, Harshvardhan. I will I will just add on one, one input to that, uh, Srishti, and I think that that was uh, impeccably detailed in terms of how to interpret that. So thanks a lot for that clarity. Now, if you look at it traditionally, the National Consumer Helpline is something that the government has made it activated for all physical retail and problems, right? Now, the National Consumer Helpline and within its ambit, e-commerce was always evasive, which basically meant as a consumer and one of the examples uh, Professor Mishra also said that as a consumer, if I have a grievance, uh, I often get redirected to that seller on online or maybe he's redirecting me further, right? It, it was always uh, evaded from the National Consumer Help Helpline and the entire hierarchy. And if you notice, one of the things that I have appreciated within this is the fact that it has been mandatory, mandatory that the e-commerce players have to come in in the ambit of National Consumer Helpline. And, and that's, that's a major, major move, which basically means it allows the government to record and have the authority on recording the consumer complaints through a national helpline and initiate a lot of investigations, which otherwise they would not have because imagine as a consumer, Mr. Minister is calling the call center of Amazon and Flipkart and Swiggy and Zomato. How does the government intervene? Right? The point of intervention would have come from if consumer is escalating it. But no, so I will, I will, I will like to intervene quickly yeah. to you. Is that this has been the National consumer plan been existing since 2005? It's not today's job. It's been there for 2005, and we remember the how why we designed it, why we established it, we all know the purpose, the intent and the objective of the National Consumer Health Line. But what kind of research has emerged? Have any studies got done out of the data which came to the government? Are we aware about what policy changes they have brought out out of those studies or that data which they have generated at the back end? We have not heard that. That's number one. Number two, what again and again I'm trying to say is that at the end of the day, from the National Consumer Helpline, the consumers are being told, you go and file a case in the consumer court. Now, is that why the consumer went there or he wants a resolution promptly done? You know, that is what the idea is. So what my contention is, the consumer bodies, the consumer organizations in the country are already doing what the National Consumer Helpline is doing. It's nothing new. The only thing is, the National Consumer Helpline is being funded from the Consumer Welfare Fund. And the other consumer organizations are doing out of their own resources, which is very limited. So there has to be an empowerment. You, you give me one case where the, the government has gone based on the data in the consumer helpline against a company to bring relief to the consumer. I have not heard that till now. You see, only one case, our late, uh, you know, Minister Rambila's past one went in the Maggie Noodle case at the National Commission, but it had to be dropped because there was some technical error. Now, my contention is if the government, which has been empowered as per the law under the Consumer Protection Act, doesn't go and doesn't file on behalf of the consumers, how do you think the things will change? It will never change. You see, our contention is that. So, we have to, yes, I'm coming to you, uh, Praveen Bhai. My only contention is we have got an opportunity in this draft rules. Can we bring in certain element where we make the Consumer Welfare Fund used more judiciously and more proactively in the interest of the consumer. This is where I come from. Mr. Mr. One, of the, one of the recommendations there was now each of the e-commerce players have a fund or, or like insurance companies have and last mile delivery partners have, they have a part of the goods value being insured. Now, what should be proposed is the national consumer helpline should further extend while they've man made mandatory in this step. They should say that the company should park a fund with them, which will be subject to arbitration. And exactly what you're saying is that this gives the power. Harshwardhan, if that fund means what? The consumer will pay at the end of the day. The no, company no, is not going to pay. Please no, 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 Mr. Mishra, that's what, not the intent. The consumer no, will no, not no, pay. But, but the consumer no, is secure. That not be the intent. No, the no, consumer no, is I'm, secure I'm, that in case no. of an escalated grievance, the government has the authority to initiate a Suomoto investigation against a company as your intent was, like how many 
uh, investigations have been started against companies by National Consumer Helpline. Are we leveraging that data or not? That authority on that fund and control over that fund gives the power to National Consumer uh, Helpline to no, say no, so many of our consumers need to be funded, and that can be done through moto. No, no, so that, no, that is why this body, uh, Central Consumer Protection Authority, has got created. It has been empowered as per law to do these kind of activities, which you are for, saying. For so, physical retail, Mr. Mr. Yes, but for e-commerce, no, because the refund policy are con completely closed loop. As you just no, said, nobody so has a control why, over that. Just, so this is an opportunity to bring in those kind of changes Bajan in the bhai. rules. Ah, Praveen Bhai, now Praveen Bhai, yes. Bajan Bhai, time and again, the, the, based on our experiences, we have made it very clear that whatever the rules are finalized, the rules have a meaning only when we have a regulatory authority like uh, Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, TRAI, which has the power for not only regulating but even to penalize, is instance penalizing them. And, and that's within a within a within a period of 30 days. So unless and until we have a regulatory mechanism for, so uh, for Praveen, Bhai, Praveen Bhai, in the 2019 Act of the Consumer Protection Act, there's a body called the Central Consumer Protection Authority, which is a regulatory body which is supposed to be managing all these consumer related transactions which are going on. So they have Bajan been Bajan Bhai, here I will just uh, I mean. This authority is basically for the consumer. Whereas, whereas these companies, the big companies, uh, are also indulging into arm twisting of the small traders and manufacturers. So, comparatively, for the entire e-commerce spectrum, there has to be a regulatory so mechanism. I think we will, we will talk on this uh, at a later stage offline. We will talk about this. You know, इसको ले चलेंगे आगे आप बिल्कुल सही बोल रहे हो ये तो हम लोग DPIIT जब गठन हुआ DPIIT के तहत हम लोग चाह रहे थे कि ये कुछ हो इस ढंग का काम इसमें रिटेलर्स को राहत मिले रिटेलर्स को प्रोटेक्शन मिले रिटेलर्स और ट्रेडर्स के लिए कुछ हो होता है पहले तो हम लोग इंटरनल ट्रेड था ही नहीं हमारे देश में बट अभी इंटरनल ट्रेड लेकर एक कोई शब्द आया तो इंटरनल ट्रेड को लेकर हम लोग अब एक फॉर्मल रूप देने का कोशिश कर रहे हैं तो हम सोचते हैं कि आप भी बातचीत कर रहे हो हम भी कर रहे हैं हम लोग सब कर रहे हैं तो बहुत जल्दी इस पे कुछ ना कुछ एक मार्गदर्शन हम लोग को प्राप्त होगा थ्रू मोदी जी टू एंश्योर दैट द रिटेलर्स आर आल्सो वेल प्रोटेक्टेड इन द कंट्री इंक्लूडिंग द स्मॉल एंड मीडियम स्केल एंड दैट इज व्हाई वी आर वर्किंग ऑन दैट आई थिंक वी हैव कम क्वाइट क्लोज टू आवर नाउ क्लोजर आई वुड लाइक टू रैप अप नाउ एंड आई वुड लाइक टू गिव दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी टू सौरभ अंसल जी सौरभ अंसल जी हु इज द को चेयर of our you know vibrant uh, retail committee within the phd chamber of commerce uh, saurabh bansal ji can you put on your uh, video and come in and give a summary and the, propose the vote of thanks saurabh bansal ji thank you so much uh, professor bijon mishra so mr divanshu kambe mr harshwardhan chohan uh, mrs meghna uh, mr amit Mr. Pradeen, Pradeen Kandelwal Ji, Dr. H.P. Kumar Ji, Prof. Bejon Kumar Mishra Ji, Yukesh Srivastav Ji, sponsors of the program, delegates from the industry, friends from the media, a very good evening to all. It is indeed my pleasure to propose a vote of thanks to our esteemed guests and dignitaries. We are extremely thankful to the knowledgeable panelists for accepting our request and presenting their views on the subject. As most of the Indians have started shopping online, rather than stepping outside their homes, the Indian e-commerce industry witnessed an increase. The e-commerce industry has been directly impacting micro, small and medium enterprises in India by providing means of financing, technology and training and has a favorable cascading effect on the other industries as well. The growth in e-commerce sector will also boost employment, increase revenue for export increase tax collection by exchequers and provide better products and services to the customers in the long term. The government has proposed new consumer protection rules for the e-commerce platform. The laws are made to encourage the best global practices and set a standard on quality and the safety for the products. Make them accessible and more affordable. I am in hope 
that after today's deliberation, there will be an understanding of new e-commerce rule that will facilitate the growth of e-commerce industry and change the consumer sentiments. Today's deliberation gives insight on the subject. We are confident that the views of the panelists will contribute and add value to the new rules. I also thank Consumer Online Foundation for supporting the event financially. With these words, I extend my thanks to all the panelists for giving their views on the subject. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for your time. It was, I think, uh, very productive. You all would get a summary of the proceedings and uh, your thoughts will be also shared with the policymakers and the authorities uh, in the, at the, appropriately by us. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you, Professor. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Professor. And stay in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. God bless all of you. Thank you very much.